Good um, evening, everybody. I would like to welcome um, everyone here tonight to the um, NCM annual lecture. So that's an annual event, and um, we've got a really exciting one this year. Um, I'm uh, Gabi Darrant. I'm the director of the National Center for Research Methods, NCRM. And this um, very short video about um, NCM and a little bit the background is actually linking to an extremely significant year for our center. Um, we are celebrating our 20th year um, anniversary, in, in fact. Um, obviously, NCM has changed a lot um, over these um, years and uh, different remits, different teams, um, and so on. But really, the focus is on, on research methods. And um, this lecture effectively forms part of this celebration. And it's absolutely fantastic to see you know, so many different people here from various different backgrounds, academia, particularly from government, um, from industry, from uh, charity sectors, and so on. We've had um, more than 600 um, registrations, in fact. And obviously, this is um, online as well, so everything will be recorded. Um, and also later on, the, the videos and, and the event will be um, available from our website after a, a few days of um, uh, processing and so on. Um, I'm really delighted to have yeah, so many um, people here from these different sectors and disciplines and so on. And it's really sort of a, a, a telling reflection on the sort of importance of the topic, first of all, that we are going to, to listen to in, in just a moment, um, but also, of course, of the reach um, of the center. And just before we move to the um, actual lecture, um, I just want to briefly say about the um, schedule for this event tonight and just a couple of words um, about NCRM. So um, I will in, in a little bit introduce um, Noche Maris, our uh, key speaker for tonight, and she will speak for about 45 minutes. And then we will have two discussions um, for about 15 minutes. And then we have about 30 minutes um, for sort of questions and open discussion, and people that are online can also use this sort of YouTube live stream to input into that. We may not be able to answer all of the questions given the time available, but, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, just very briefly, um, a, a little bit of uh, background about NCRM. So NCRM is one of the key UK providers of research methods training and capacity building. So we are really focusing on high quality training um, that is across sectors. And we really have the mission to sort of advance methodological expertise across the social sciences and beyond, so particularly also this interdisciplinary, and we are really um, focusing with our lecture today um, on that. And we are funded by the ESRC, and at the moment we are a network of 12 partners, um, led by the University of Southampton all across the, the UK, and we are running very many courses and events um, across the year, um, and it's really on a vast array of, of topics, uh, research methods related, of course. Um, we have several hundred um, researchers that we are training every year. In fact, of the last four years, we trained uh, more than 4,000 people just on courses alone. Obviously, in addition, we have got loads of events where sometimes several thousand people uh, sign up for, and some things are obviously um, online. Um, we are also supporting the research community um, via, for example, online learning resources, and everything is available free um, on our website. So please have a look on, on our website to, to visit um, that and see a little bit um, what we are offering. And we've also developed strategic um, partnerships with, for example, ESRC investments and other key non-academic uh, stakeholders um, across the UK over the last um, uh, few years. Um, and we have run, or we are running, a number of strategic um, initiatives which really aim to sort of nurture innovation and research methods. And we are bringing together researchers from diverse fields, really uh, different ways of lives and research environments. And we are really aiming to respond to the very many challenges facing us today and into the future, in particular, obviously, from a methods perspective. And that really brings me to um, very neatly to tonight's lecture and the sort of topic. We will explore one of the most compelling new um, issues facing researchers and indeed more broadly society and this sort of focus on sort of rise of technological changes, including um, artificial intelligence. And basically throughout this year, 2024, 20, uh, uh, we in NCM, we are trying to explore um, the role of generative AI on social research and the challenges and also opportunities that actually will bring. It's just one of the topics um, we focus on. So I'm really thrilled that this evening we have a um, highly distinguished leader in this critical area delivering our annual lecture. And I would like to do, introduce Professor Noche Mares uh, tonight. Um, I just say a few words um, about you before I, I hand over. 
Um, she's a really leading um, scholar in the field of science, technology, and society, and she's based at the University of Warwick. And she's conducted extensive research on participation in technological societies and made hugely influential contributions to interdisciplinary methods and methods development. So that's really something uh, we, we are keen on. Um, her re recent research focuses on sort of experiments, for example, examining diverse forms of testing in societal uh, settings from street trials, and we hear a little bit about that in your, in your talk of intelligent vehicles to fact checks and media environments and so on. And her lecture today is entitled after the automation of methods, the case for situational analytics. And we will explore here the new sort of challenges that AI and other technological changes poses to the sciences of society. And drawing on your uh, recent research, um, Professor uh, Mares will present a new set of methods that social researchers across disciplines have developed to address these different challenges in society. Situational mapping, situational analytics, so we will um, hear um, a lot more about that. Um, and just very briefly, I would also like to introduce the two discussants afterwards. Um, Carrie Friese, Friese. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Associate Professor of Sociology at LSE, and you've been a co-developer of Situation Analysis, and also um, Rachel Caldicutt, researcher and strategist, um, or strategist specializing in the social impact of new and emerging technologies, and you are founder and executive director of research consultancy, um, for example, Careful Industries, and uh, in 2019, Rachel was awarded an OBE for services for the digital society. Um, so, it's going to be an absolutely fascinating lecture, I believe, and I imagine everyone is really thoroughly um, looking forward to hearing much more about the topic and us uh, discussing afterwards. So, without any further delay, I'd like to hand over to our key speaker for this evening, Professor Noce Mares. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good evening. It's a real pleasure and also an honor uh, to give this lecture this evening at the invitation of the, of the National Center for Research Methods. Um, I will be looking forward to the responses uh, of, of uh, these two esteemed discussants and also to then discuss uh, with all of you afterwards. To start, I would like to introduce you to Yugaza Bot, a AI, an AI enabled focus group moderator. This bot can run focus groups in 100 languages. It can structure your data analysis for you and it will document everything. Now, expect that by the end of the evening, we will be able to decide together whether we believe this claim. Uh, but this is how we're often uh, introduced to AI and the application of AI um, in social science. Since the release of powerful new large language models in 2018, the fully automated generation of natural language has been hailed as the next frontier in the seemingly inexhaustible digital revolution. Computational systems like OpenAI's ChatGPT, that needs no introduction, um, a system like that has not only had a massive up uptake around the world, but it is also deemed capable by many of human-like reasoning and expression. And the proliferation um, of those kind of claims has also helped in spawning a wide range of additional applications that built on ChatGPT uh, to um, uh, yeah, create real-world applications of, of chatbots and large language models. Now, it appears that social research is an especially fertile ground for the creation of these customized applications of large language models. So alongside 
focus group bots like this uh, dedicated chatbot. Um, there is um, uh, an application of ChatGPT for focus group moderation, which has been developed by a company called Speak AI. There are AI-enabled surveys that we might discuss later, and applications like BERT Topic, which adapt this large language model for the thematic analysis of textual data. Now, these kind of applications of generative um, AI for social research are often pitched as a way of scaling up research designs, of making resource savings, and optimizing research management. As Speak AI, the creator of this uh, ChatGPT application for focus group research, puts it, ChatGPT for focus groups will save you 80% of your time and 80% of your costs. That's the, the way in which the sort of, uh, yeah, the, the application is pitched. Crucially, however, the use of generative AI in social research is not just framed as an operational matter. The promotional material of the same company lists various ways in which chatbot moderated focus groups are better than their human-led um, variant, noting that GTP can be used to ask questions in a more natural way and will allow for more meaningful conversation and insight. Now, I am then particularly struck by the ways in which advocates of AI-based social science and science make the case for the uptake of AI in social science on substantive grounds. So here's an example uh, of, of, a, of a similar claim uh, by organizational scientists Kuhler and Sauermann, who state in a recent article, AI can perform core research tasks, such as generating research questions, processing data, and solving problems. Generative AI, in other words, is being framed today as a way of delegating knowledge production to machines. And I believe that that is what's uh, most distinctive in some ways. In, <clears throat> in this lecture, I would therefore like to ask, on what grounds is this justified? And with what consequences? I will begin by offering some wider reflections on the uptake of large language models in social research, and I will identify a number of more general challenges that it poses for the creation of knowledge about society. I will then introduce an interdisciplinary method called situational mapping, which I believe can help equip us to address these challenges. Next, I will present some findings and some insights from recent collaborative research projects in the area of AI and society that I have conducted together with others, some of whom are in this room, at the University of Warwick. Um, and in, in this research on AI and society, we used AI-based methods alongside other methods. Uh, and I, I will yeah, try and introduce that range, but often and indeed perhaps always within a framework of situational mapping. Our use of AI in these projects was relatively basic, but I think it can offer a good ground for exploring some of the implications of AI for social science from a practitioner perspective. In my conclusion, I will summarize what I believe will be required of us to address um, these implications. I will make the case, some advance warning, that we will need to develop new and possibly quite different um, evaluative frameworks uh, for assessing um, uh, robustness uh, of our methods in, in uh, social research. But I will also make a wider claim that um, yeah, that will try and um, sort of make it um, necessary for, for social, social researchers from many different backgrounds to become much more curious than uh, we sometimes uh, are today 
about the way in which automation unsettles our methods and disrupts more um, established frameworks um, in, in social science research. Okay, so we'll start with an overview of challenges. Machine learning based applications for the generation of nat natural language are today widely used for a variety of tasks in science and in social science. Automated transcription of speech has become quite common for online interviews, um, which involves the creation of more or less instant textual transcripts. So is the use of automated language translation and the use of language generators in peer review and scientific writing. The letter was recently brought to my attention when someone mentioned a study which showed a significant increase in the use of the word delve in the titles and abstracts of scientific articles, a word for which apparently the chatbot ChatGPT has a fondness. It was also pointed out to me that this does not necessarily mean that scientists now have ChatGPT write their articles for them. It rather indicates a growing reliance on large language models to improve clarity of impression, uh, clarity of expression, sorry, and to speed up the writing process. In this regard, we might call um, a lot of the applications of AI in social science as involving the automation of, automa of operational tasks. However, crucially, the use of AI in social science is not just limited to these kind of tasks, meaning tasks that do not involve the creation of new knowledge necessarily. Um, yeah, operational tasks, I, it's, I think it's important to be precise in how I define them, are then tasks that are about conserving and, and disclosing meaning during the processing of data and the write of, of results. They're not about creating new knowledge or new meaning. However, over the last years, computational social scientists have advocated what I think of as the delegation of knowledge acts to AI, such as the annotation of interview and conversation data, uh, most notably. Gillardi and colleagues have reviewed the use of ChatGPT for the analysis of content, discourse and conversation, positing that the chatbot now outperforms human coders for these type of tasks and claiming that they do better than their human counterparts for annotation uh, tasks, including relevance detection, stance, topic uh, analysis, and, and frame detection. While machine learning models have been used for several decades in computational social science, what is significant about this kind of claim is that here, general purpose pre-trained models, GPT, this is what GPT stands for, general purpose pre-trained, I came to realize, that these general generic models can now be used without any custom training by social scientists on their data, and this without even providing the model with examples of their data, so with no custom training uh, or examples at all. Now, this sort of very ambitious claim that now we can perform social science with general purpose AI um, has been questioned by other colleagues, uh, including my co colleague Michael Costello, who is here and I hope will, will join us in the discussion later. Um, but even those who are more cautious in their application of large language models in social science still make am very ambitious claims to the effect that, for instance, the claim by Ziems and all that large language models can reliably <coughs> classify and explain social phenomena like political ideology. These same authors also propose that social scientists can use these applications to implement social theory in their writing uh, and using uh, ChatGPT and other uh, models to stylistically restructure utterances so that they come, are brought in line with a social theoretical framework. So these are examples of this kind of delegation of, of knowledge acts 
to AI. Now, scholars, for s some years now, have worked hard to demonstrate that there are significant problems with these proposed uses of generative AI in social science. First and foremost, they have shown that this use of large language models uh, in, for social research is marred by significant biases. These models, generally speaking, perform much better in the analysis of data that they have been trained on, which means they tend to do much better at analyzing the English language internet. That's sort of the, the brief summary. Ashwin and colleagues found that large language models perform less well in the analysis of non-English interview data, and they also found that the results of such analysis are less accurate for distinctive social economic attributes. So the speech of some subjects um, uh, can be more reliably analyzed using AI than the speech of other subjects and speech in other contexts. I find it important to note that such biases introduced by AI in social science do not only concern the quality of AI-based social data analysis itself, but in the longer term may well affect the wider social science knowledge landscape. As free-to-use models like ChatGPT perform especially well on easily available English language data, their popularity will, is yeah, will, will quite probably make growth of this type of research more likely, while the analysis of minority phenomena, if I can use such a term, will continue to require custom configured models and custom configured research design. That is to say, the uptake of general purpose AI to conduct social research may result in biases and growing biases in the overall empirical coverage of social science. The push towards the automation of social research may also contribute to growing research asymmetries in social research. While automated social research tools, which will be easy to use, will work especially well for mainstream English language phenomena uh, and are as such also likely to be available to many researchers, iterative custom configured research is and will then become more likely uh, to be framed by comparison as a kind of a luxury research. The uptake of AI in social science is then likely to have important implications for the political economy of knowing society in an age of AI. But I would like to direct your attention now also to something else, namely the question of whether and how AI-enabled methods will help to advance social science. I have been fond uh, of noticing um, the use in articles by computational social scientists uh, of um, the work of the philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn. The term paradigm change is very often mentioned in computational social science articles uh, about uh, the use of AI for knowing society. And there is one quote in particular that keeps returning in these articles, namely Kuhn's claim that paradigm change um, and advances in science do not just come about through the formulation of new ideas, but through the invention of new tools and new methodologies. There's something odd, however, about the use of this quote in these articles. Uh, that, yeah, and the use of these quotes in relation to AI-based social science. Because it seems that to date, the most successful examples of the use of large language models in social science operate within strikingly conventional method methodological frameworks, focus group research, content analysis, conversation analysis. Yes, the tools are certainly new, but the methodologies, Perhaps not so much. I would like to discuss what I'd like to provocatively name 
this relative lack of methodological innovation in AI-based social science uh, in more detail uh, in what follows. But to sum up, I can then say that I see two important challenges that the use of large language models poses for social science alongside the major problem of bias. So this is first these growing asymmetries between instrumental um, research, a sort of fully automated research that works with free and easy to use tools, and then on the other side, custom made, uh, custom configured uh, social research projects. So the asymmetry between those types of social research and second, this paradoxical failure to realize the opportunities that new tools open up for the creation of new methodology in social science. Yeah. I will go on in a moment uh, to show uh, how these challenges of AI, how they can be addressed uh, um, in social research that works with situational mapping. But before I do that, I would just like to um, give uh, one more lens uh, on this problematic of how AI is introduced in social science, because I think it will, yeah, it will help us, it will put us in a better position to evaluate uh, the, uh, yeah, what AI can do for social science and what it cannot do for social science. So the three challenges that I just presented um, that AI poses for social science, in my view, have much to do with what I think of as the delegation model for the use of AI in social research. This model sets up the wholesale transfer of knowledge acts from human researchers to automated systems as the normative frame and the ideal to strive for in using AI for social science. This kind of approach is latent, it's implicit in the very definition of AI, which is often defined in terms of the capacity of machines to perform tasks that would have otherwise required human intelligence. So this kind of definition of AI implies already an evaluative principle, namely one that sets up an equivalence between human and machine performance as the standard uh, by which to assess AI. This principle is still with us today in the shape of methods of accuracy testing uh, of uh, large language models. An approach whereby indeed both human and machine performance in certain knowledge text is, tasks is judged against the same standard. So there's a kind of an equ equivalence, an idealized equivalence between human and machine performance uh, in knowledge tasks that is implied by these kind of evaluative frameworks like accuracy testing. Computational social science apply a similar principle when they use criteria like intercoder agreement to evaluate how well machines and humans are at the coding of content, the annotation of data. Now the problem with this approach is that in order to evaluate the quality of research performed by machines and humans, it posits their sameness. It posits equivalence between humans and machines. The limitations of such an approach are now being discussed, including by Turnberg, who argues in favor of what we could call a human in the loop approach or a coordination model for the use of AI. He proposes that the aim should be to integrate large language models into research design, but to make this integration conditional not on whether the alignment between machine and human can be assumed, but whether it can be achieved. So there's a kind of a, a, a commitment to undo this assumption that for um, machines to do well in social science, they have to be equivalent uh, in their performance to humans and the other way around. Now, I think this is one of the most promising ways forward, and I will um, uh, explain why I think so. Um, but it's also really important to note that it's very difficult today to pursue any alternative to um, this uh, kind of delegation model. 
um, because these ideas of equivalence between human and machine tasks are baked into AI-based methods, as we will see. How then to address these, um, yeah, in some ways quite general and um, deep-seated challenges that AI poses for knowing society? Now, it is here that the distinctive set of interdisciplinary methods, digital, visual, and participatory methods of situational mapping can help us to uh, advance in how we understand uh, the role of AI in knowing society. The approach situational mapping has roots in sociology going back to the early uh, 20th century and has been adopted across several uh, disciplines over the last decades. Situational mapping can be defined in terms of um, following three commitments. First, it makes the situation the unit of analysis. Situations have been defined very differently by sociologists, but it almost always involves a grounding of, ah, I'm going too fast, a grounding of our understanding of society in a specific place in society, say in a hospital or a city, or the commitment to ground social analysis in a particular social grouping, the perspective of, say, anti-nuclear activists or nurses. Second feature of situational mapping is that it takes up data mapping as a qualitative method. It uses these techniques of mapping entities to surface and qualify what composes situations. So in the words uh, of Adele uh, Clark, the aim of situational mapping is to specify what entities of varying scale and type compose the situation. So it's a compositional method, you could say, in that regard. Historically, this approach has been developed, as I already mentioned, um, in sociology. Um, and it has historically also been primarily used for the analysis of interview data and field work data. But it has since been taken up in many different fields, including in design research, where as part of participatory design, situational mapping is used to uh, plot uh, future scenarios, in this case, of mobility practices, of how we travel, and the plotting of these future scenarios in a social space composed of governance, ecology, culture, infrastructure, economy. And also, the approach has been used in digital media studies, as here in early work, um, where we relied on hyperlink analysis to map conflicts uh, that were emerging uh, on the web in the uh, early 2000s around the uh, construction of the Narmada dams um, in Gujarat, in India. Situational mapping, then, uh, is what I'm trying to say, is an avowedly interdisciplinary method. To clarify what is involved in the use of situational mapping to analyze online data, I have previously offered the term situational analytics. Situational analytics combines um, fieldwork-based situational analysis with digital methods, which these days often rely on automated data capture via so-called APIs for application programming interface, so capturing data through uh, semi-automated means from platforms like Twitter or YouTube. And here you see an example of a mapping um, of the introduction of uh, automated vehicles in different cities uh, um, and different places um, in the West Midlands. And the analysis of um, issues this raised on Twitter um, uh, yeah, in, in that early period in 2016. I included this example to make clear that when you use situational mapping um, to analyze online uh, phenomena, you inevitably end up mapping situations across different settings, in this case, across Twitter and the streets uh, and places 
where automated vehicles were being introduced. So there's a kind of a heterogeneous kind of yeah, space in which situations uh, are, are mapped in, in that case. It's also important to note that once you work with this kind of online data, that um, situational analytics ends up often scaling up uh, the situation and the analysis of it because it is now possible to analyze a situation within a whole platform setting, a context. So how does the phenomenon unfold on Twitter? And we often then use semi-automated methods to analyze and, and create maps uh, of situations um, at scale. Now the possibility that I'm interested in here is how, how can these methods of situational mapping and situational analytics provide an alternative framework and a different orientation for addressing the challenges that AI poses for knowing society. Rather than answering this question in the abstract, what I would like to do is to show you how we applied situational mapping and the principles of situational mapping in recent research on AI and society, and in that way, hopefully, make clear to you um, how um, yeah, we offer a different framework in, in doing so. Shaping AI is a three-year international research project in which we mapped public discourse about AI in four countries for a 10-year period between 2012 and 2022. In this project, we applied the principles of situational mapping in the following way. To start with, we grounded our analysis of UK controversies about AI in a specific community. Rather than identifying controversies about AI by querying Twitter or querying the media, we started by consulting with AI and society experts in the UK, which we defined broadly in terms of all those with a stake in the issue and committed to genuine debate. In our online experts consultation, which we conducted in the autumn of 2021, we asked, what, according to you, so according to these experts, has been most controversial about AI in the last 10 years? Just grounding our analysis in the perspective and the standpoint of this community. We sent out our consultation to 250 experts and received 53 responses. Now, it took us some time to interpret these responses, as it was not immediately obvious what type of controversies they had identified. In the sociology of science, a controversy is usually defined in terms of the staging of disagreement between experts. But we found relatively few examples of this among the responses. So what had we found instead? Through close reading of the consultation responses, we identified three different types of what you could call forms of controversiality of AI, different ways in which AI uh, was becoming or had become controversial. And we called these topics, frictions, and problematizations. Now, focusing on the, the, the middle category, that of AI friction, these were especially prominent among the results to our consultation. Frictions are not disputes or controversies per se, but they refer to technological systems, sites, or incidents in which AI gives rise to demonstrable trouble, harm, or const contestation in specific environments in society. And here you see a range of these frictions that were mentioned in the consultation. And here you find them listed in the middle category. So these are responses to the question, what makes AI controversial? Um, we also uh, indicate here the topic in relation to which these frictions, AI frictions, uh, were mentioned by our respondents. Now, you, you can see that the topic of facial recognition has an especially broad number of frictions associated with it, and so do tracking and tra targeting and corporate research culture. And you also see that GPT-3 
in autumn 2021 already figured quite prominently among the, um, the AI frictions. And so did the firing um, or resignation of Timnit Gebru, a Google uh, researcher who had written a controversial paper about large language models. Now, is this then how AI became controversial in the UK in the relevant period, 212 to 22? Did it become controversial to the topic, through the topicalization of these frictions? I'm afraid it is more complicated than that because uh, we continued um, uh, conducting these con consultations in, in the different countries that participated in the projects and found, again, quite a different distribution of AI friction among the responses to our consultations in four countries. Um, the, the consultations in France, Canada and Germany were conducted in a later period in 2022 and 23. And here you see large language models as a category emerging as, as really a, a dominant uh, sort of site um, of, of, of this, this friction. One reason I'm showing you this is to show that when we ground the mapping of AI controversies in different communities, which is what we did through this method, we, are, we become confronted by the variability, and you could even say the instability of our empirical object. We found, we, we started by looking for controversies, but we found frictions instead. And these frictions did not have stable properties. The frictions that were surfaced in the 2021 consultation in the UK were very different from those surfaced in the other consultations. Once you adopt a situational mapping approach to AI in society, you find that you, we find ourselves frequently shifting our frames and we find ourselves frequently reframing our empirical object. And this is something that can seem incompatible with the stable frame of reference that seems required for robust data analysis. Now, in the next phase of our research, we worked with AI methods to uh, further develop our situational mapping of AI frictions. To analyze debates sparked by AI, we turned to Twitter as a setting where at that time, um, one could still find uh, exchanges between academics, journalists, activists, and industry perspectives on AI. We curated Twitter data sets for a selected set of our AI frictions um, by querying the Twitter API for publications that had uh, been mentioned as, as relevance to these specific topics um, in the consultation. We used um, large language models in different ways in this work, uh, including to determine which tweets are in scope and out of scope of the debates that we were interested in. But we were um, introduced in particular by Shaping AI team members, Michael Costella and James Tripp, to BERT topic um, for bidirectional encoder representations for transformers, um, a term that might need further unpacking than I can give here. What we learned about this model is that it enables the analysis of so-called word embeddings to determine what are representative topics for a given text. It does this uh, by using a pre-trained large language models to convert text to a large number of what are called vector representations in high dimensional space, these embeddings. And these are then reduced through cluster techniques and a measure um, called term uh, frequency, inverse document frequency, to, to reduce, uh, yeah, it's like a, a, to determine a relevance of topics, and which makes it possible to create weightings for different topics and then generate succinct topic representations. Now, what we found fascinating and I can only say exciting uh, in applying BERT topic to our Twitter data is that it seemed to us that BERT was capable of capturing contextual expression. 
So here you see the topics that Bert detected in the Twitter conversations for our four uh, objects. Gadar uh, is an application uh, for, for the prediction uh, of uh, sexual orientation based on facial analysis using machine learning. And it says DeepMind um, involves the controversy around uh, the use of an app by DeepMind uh, in the Royal Free Hospital and which involved a large amount of data being transferred to DeepMind. Compass relates to the use of um, uh, recommenders or, or predictive algorithms um, in uh, the courts in the US, US um, to assess likelihood of recidivism, which uh, sparked a lot of controversy. And finally, stochastic parrots um, is the debates pertaining to the dismissal, dismissal of Google researcher Timnit Gabru and her paper uh, that she co-authored with others on the dangers of stochastic parrots. Now, the word clusterings that BERT uh, uh, generated, and uh, this is after URLs and um, uh, Twitter handles and uh, emojis and ad mentions were all removed from the data, so it's from clean data. But what, what this kind of word clusterings for us seemed to capture really well was the unresolvedness of conversations. Like people don't paper. It's not quite a topic. It's more an issue of debate. Now, in this respect, BERT topic for us aligned really well with the experience of coding Twitter conversations man manually. So we had undertaken manual coding of Twitter conversations as part of this study. And we were struck by the ways in which often meaning was unstable or meaning multiplied in the conversations that we coded, which made it very difficult to assign stable topics to these conversations. So here you see an example of this. It's a conversation which starts with a kind of a, with a, a defense uh, of the decision uh, in which uh, Timnit Gebru uh, ended up leaving um, Google. But then the conversation turns into a debate about uh, the sources of bias in large language models, whether these derive from data or whether there are also other sources of bias involved uh, in the application of large language models. Now, in, the conversa in a conversation like this, you see both on the level of the tweet as on the level of the reply chain that meaning shifts constantly and often, indeed, uh, multiple frames may be ac applicable to utterances, such as in this, you missed a word only. Does that pertain to the debate about the dismissal or about the, the, the bias of the models? Now, when one, con when one does topic labeling, one is forced to resolve that kind of ambiguity. And we duly obliged by um, attributing um, uh, topics uh, to conversations and solving this by attributing multiple topics in some cases. But we felt that this kind of stabilizing of the meaning of the conversations through this kind of labeling, in a way, did not meant that we analyzed an object that wasn't actually the lively conversation um, that we wanted uh, to analyze. Now, when comparing um, the codes uh, of BERT and the codes uh, that we created manually for these topics, there, there is again a sense where the um, sort of reliance on a fixed frame to evaluate our research was for us not, did not get us to the interesting uh, insight. So you could try and establish an equivalence w when evaluating how the codes by BERT, which you see in brown, and the codes uh, in purple, which are the codes that we created according to our code book, how they are equivalent. You know, is resigned, fired, didn't resign, possibly a debate about corporate research culture. Um, we can note that while the human coding, and these are the codes of that um, friction, that debate around uh, stochastic parrot on the level of the whole data set, so this is not twi a tweet or conversation specific, 
You can say, oh, BERT found climate environmental car and environmental green centers. Human coding gave us environmental impact. So we can, we can try and, and look for the degree of equivalence. But it seemed much more important to us to look instead for um, where BERT and uh, us deviated interestingly. So while our, our labels identified what you could call problems on a structural level, power, research culture, BERT's topic are located on a, you could say, empirical level, resigned, didn't resign, where um, we coded for male white privilege in AI, BERT codes for anti-racism, racism. And so it is this kind of um, exploring of the, the way in which there is a contestation and a negotiation of the meanings of this conversation um, that, that actually, that is what, what you can begin to explore when you put the human next to the machine code. So not a fixed frame of is it the same or is it not the same, but what, how is meaning being negotiated and contested within this space opened up by um, machine interpretation. So I will return to this question of evaluation in the conclusion, but I briefly want to um, show you research from a different project called AI in the Street, because I think it's very important that even though we are now exploring how we can make AI work for social research, it should, we should not necessarily conclude that if it works, can work for social research, that from the standpoint of situational analysis, this kind of AI-based data analysis is the way forward, because I think it very much is not. So in a different project called AI in the Street, we um, work with uh, a very different set of mapping methods to um, locate AI in society and to do an analysis of how AI manifests in specific social environments, as here in the intelligent mobility testbed uh, for the testing of automated vehicles that has been created in Coventry. Now, we're currently um, creating uh, and preparing uh, a set of listening walks through this street um, where we invite residents and others uh, who, who live in uh, Coventry to walk with us and to map what, how does AI manifest um, in the street. Now, when you conduct these walks, this is what AI data capture looks like the form of these little brown boxes that are hanging in the uh, lampposts and also um, in the traffic lights. At the same time, this kind of infrastructure has been framed online as providing access uh, to testbed data. So it turns out that this Holyhead Road has an API through which users can access scene-specific data assets and gain access to real-world live data feeds. Now, there is a disjuncture in this regard, which I think is really important, between the way in which AI manifests as a method that we can deploy within the space of data analysis and the way in which AI manifests as hardware in actual environments in society. And it is to explore and, and, and really thematize these disjunctures that again, situational mapping becomes an important method. So we're working um, with also using uh, uh, digital technologies like um, the Unheard City app, which detects the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth signals that the testbed equipment is emitting to create mappings of the sort of AI space as it is seen from the street. Um, and yeah, just to, to um, uh, refer to the, this image on the right, um, uh, what you see on the right is the way in which the, the testbed is described as part of the uh, mandatory public 
uh, sort of co consultation for the test bed, uh, which you know means that for a lot of residents and pe people who pass through the street, the test bed is completely invisible. So it's a kind of an act of, of making visible uh, how AI is, is creating the street as data space, but to do that within the street. I'm going to um, conclude um, and um, sum up. Um, so I've been taking you on some detours uh, through research on AI in society, which also in some cases works with AI methods. I've, been ta I've taken you on this kind of meandering uh, um, uh, uh, a tour um, to, to make clear that when it comes to evaluating what is the impact on AI for social science and what is the right way for social science to engage with AI, it is really important, I think, that we keep a very open mind. Um, so the, the models that prescribe performance testing or accuracy testing as the way to evaluate the use of AI in social, social science posit a very restrictive homogenizing framework where it is really the equivalence between how humans code data and how machines code data that serves as the kind of evaluative framework. I've been trying to argue, argue that AI-based methods also have very different possibilities where they can make us attentive to the way in which meaning proliferates, is negotiated, is contested, and is fundamentally unstable um, in social life. And so the question is, can we develop evaluative frameworks for the use of AI in social science that affirm that kind of um, instability and the, the, uh, of meaning in social life? And it's what I would like to kind of, um, yeah, really put in the center as a bigger uh, challenge for which there isn't necessarily a quick solution. Also wanted to just emphasize um, that staying within the frameworks of social data anal analysis can have really quite blinding effects. Um, I've shown it in these last slides uh, for um, automated mobility testing infrastructure, which is of course a different data capture infrastructure than the ones that we maybe use as social scientists. But I think there's an important similarity in that AI-based methods often create very little opportunity for the subjects whose data uh, is, is, uh, yeah, provides the raw material for analysis to actually speak back to the analysis. So this is why I think as a second challenge or way of, of responding to the challenge of AI, developing frames for the participatory method like listening walks is actually central, should be central to how we respond to AI in social science. And finally, and this is also a moment I think to hand over uh, to, uh, to our respondents, is that in, in approaching these challenges in this way, what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm really centering sort of the situational um, qualities um, of social life um, the messiness, the negotiation of meaning without which things don't happen, the need to always coordinate action for it to be even be interpretable, and that to center these qualities of social life and of social phenomena, um, we will, uh, I think, find ourselves working sometimes with uh, and sometimes against uh, the automation of method. Um, and in doing so, uh, I hope that what we can really um, uh, put center stage is not necessarily the drive to automate uh, social science, but the question of where this meets uh, the requirements uh, of uh, knowing society. Thank you very much, Norge. I would like to welcome um, to come forward our first discussion, Carrie. Thank you.
So um, first, I just want to say a big thank you to NCRM for inviting me to comment on Norcha's keynote address this evening. And I also want to thank Norcha for giving us such a timely, rich, and important talk on AI and social science research methods. So um, I should start by saying that I come to this event, uh, and I'm assuming I was asked to do this, as an expert in situational analysis. I was one of Adele Clark's uh, PhD students when she was writing the first edition of this book. Thereafter, Rachel Washburn and I co-authored with Adele the second edition of Situational Analysis, as well as two edited collections on situational analysis and practice. So in this context, I've given many workshops on the method, um, and it is a largely qualitative method. Um, and these workshops often focus on making situational social worlds arenas and positional maps based on, as Norcha said, largely um, interview material, uh, field notes from, from ethnography, but also documents of various kinds. Um, these workshops are very hands-on and analog, if you like. We use paper and pens, we work around a table, and we really focus in on different people's projects and the situations that they're interested in. Except that these aren't always analog, of course, because the workshops are often on Zoom. And maybe that's another story, but maybe it's part of the story. It was in one of these workshops that I was asked if and how digital methods could be included in situational analysis. And I have to say, I was incredibly relieved that Norcha had already answered that question for me in developing situational analytics. And I've since argued that situational analysis needs situational analytics, not only to study the digital, not only if, if the, it's being used to study a, a typically digital situation, um, but also to do reflexive research whenever digital infrastructures appear in our situational maps, and whether or not those situations are of interest to us as a, a site of the digital. I'm really convinced by Norch's argument that we need to use digital methods in order to surface their infrastructural effects, including on our research. Um, and I've, but I've also argued that this cannot come at the expense of the very real embodied people sitting at the end of the computer screen or not within our situations as well. And so I think this keynote uh, is really important because we see Norcha explicitly bringing together her long-standing work on material participation on the one hand with situational analytics on the other. And I think this is a really exciting way to foreground both people and things. So I have to admit that I have never used chat GPT or any other site of generative AI because I would personally rather not feed these neural networks at the current moment when the only consensus seems to be that there are serious and uneven distributed dangers. And I, and I should say that Norcha herself has given me the confidence in using my outside position in relation to the digital as an analytic device of sorts. So in this context, as an outsider, I had some questions for Norcha. One thing that I think is powerful analytically about situational analysis is in highlighting the invisible, and this comes up particularly in your research in Warwick. Who or what is not present? What is unsaid? Who is represented by others but unable to represent themselves? These are the questions that situational analysis asks in order to make power and power relations palpable. I wondered, can AI surface the invisible or the unsaid? Or is this the limit of AI? And what are the implications of how this question is answered? Now, while I have refrained from using things like chat GPT, I am also interested in and curious about the possibilities of AI for qualitative research. And so I found myself listening to Norcha's talk with some very practical questions in mind as well. I'm part of a consortium of researchers from several countries who are currently seeking funding to conduct qualitative interviews with, a very, lar with very large samples that aim to be nationally, as nationally representative as possible. 
And with this, we're building on Professor David Grusky's American Voices project. I was drawn to this project because we can confirm that the, inter in, that the interviews were indeed with real people and not an AI-generated interview of what a person with sociodemographic X might say. In that sense, we aim to target people who don't leave as many digital traces. And for us, the question of bias is therefore the question. We would still have people do the qualitative interviews, and I have to say that I am unconvinced by the proponents of AI that they could do a better job. Uh, maybe just just can't I just can't wrap my head around that that belief. Um, but one of our aims is to test large language models to see if they could be used to help us with the coding of what would be a, a huge data set. So we would need to use AI to identify sections of text on both specifically tangible but also less tangible topics. Norch's talk really made me question the extent to which we are assuming the delegation of tasks approach to AI in, in, this, in this coding process. And I have to say I had a bit of an aha moment where I realized just how much I have assumed this delegation model whenever I think about AI. And so this, this shift that things could be otherwise for me was, was quite powerful. Um, to think instead about alignments and participatory models I think is a really productive way for us to possibly do this coding quite differently. If funded, we would work collaboratively with computational social scientists and data scientists to see how humans and AI can work together on different types of qualitative coding. And so I do see the potential for an intervention with the kinds of alignments that Norcha suggests. And so I am wondering what the varieties of participation might look like going forward. Uh, as I do assume that AI will become an increasing part of qualitative research. So thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, so I find myself in an unusual moment here because I'm a, um, uh, a um, practitioner. Um, and the research that I do is really a means to an end. And I think what is very interesting about w w what Nortje has outlined um, um, this evening is something that is very troubling when we're looking at particularly policy and regulating um, technology, particularly new technologies that are rolling out. Because one of the things that particularly troubles me is what do we do before um, um, participatory models? How do we know what is really happening as it is happening? Um, one of the things we've seen over the last, I suppose, maybe 20 years is the extent to which um, the um, regulatory adaptations that happen happen really often based on um, prevalence. So to give you an example that is not AI, but thinking about um, online um, safety. We're in a world in which we, you know, we've had um, message boards and uh, forums for over 30 years now. And just at the end of last year in the UK, we had the first piece of um, legislation, which is the beginning of trying to get our arms around that. It will probably take at least another four years for the regulatory environment around that to be actually working and um, stood up, which means that by the time we're really regulating this uh, 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 thing that has emerged and been emerging, we will have 30 years at least of human activity to think about. And there's a real opportunity and a moment, I think, to, to use mapping and understanding of what is happening now as a lever for what comes um, prior. You know, so the th things that I'm particularly interested in, I think, are how do we know when an outcome, whether it is a good or a harm, is just 
beginning to emerge. How do we see it happening? Very often to the most marginalised um, communities. And, you know, the um, burden of evidence that is asked for um, is very often more than anecdotes or hearsay. Which means that we're often left with um, polling, right? So, so polling tells us about a thing that has emerged, right? It's already happened. By the time an issue can be um, captured in a yes, no, don't know um, form, everybody knows about it. And I think what's incredibly um, valuable and interesting is to think how mapping of the sort we've seen here might be a, a thing that community owns and does. Rather than mapping happening um, to us, it might happen um, by us or with us and become a piece of evidence that we're all able um, to use. And I think Overall, it will take us a long um, time to roll out properly an and, um, um, anticipatory um, methods and models into um, regulatory um, um, ways of working. I spent a little bit of time working in um, regulators in the UK. And the burden of evidence that is needed is, is like very, very high. But I think there's something fascinating and interesting, particularly as we're thinking about how automated technologies will be rolled out in ways that most of us do and don't notice, understand, um, how we might all have the ability to map differently and show the impacts. Uh, and just to conclude, you know, I would say that lots of the work that I do um, is about helping people to work out what's likely to happen next. And normally, the people who are given the power to think about what is likely to happen next, they might be enormous companies, they might be um, defence specialists. Um, most of us have to rely on what we sense in the moment or what we talk about with our um, 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 friends. And that actually now that the prevalence of the sorts of tools that we could all use for m m mapping is um, greater than ever before, Perhaps it's an opportunity. Perhaps there's like a covert thing that could happen here where we could all be um, telling other kinds of uh, story. Thank you.